Good morning. Good morning to the last day of SecupDev. Um, the last um, talk by me. This time, I'm going to talk about client-side um, security technologies. Um, I've talked about these things um, in, in the, uh, the other talks um, here and there a bit. In this talk, I'm going to give you more details, and we're going to look especially at the rise and fall of client-side technologies. I'm going to look at why we have them, why they're important, but also why there are problems with these technologies and how we can deal with that uh, in the future. I'm going to end with some practical advice of stuff you should be doing um, this year or things you should be paying attention to this year. I'm going to give you some, um, you know, some pointers there. Client-side security is something that um, seems a bit strange. So um, if you look at, at client-side security, um, people often advise against um, doing this. So you have server-side security checks, then people say, well, you should uh, be using server-side security, not client-side security. It, it seems strange to do security checks in JavaScript. But from the talk on Monday, you probably know already that uh, applications are no longer restricted to the server-side. So we have this thing called front-end applications. Um, we need to deal with that, and um, that's definitely something that is coming along. So um, my apologies, my pointer is not working, um, so it's going to be a bit messy doing that with my computer, but let's, let's go on. Oh, there's a backup. Awesome. All right, thanks for the, the backup pointer. So let's get started and let's talk about front-end security. So, okay, let's... Front-end security is a thing. This is an article from, from two years ago. Um, you should be concerned about front-end security. Um, essentially, when we talk about front-end, we mean uh, client-side security. We mean uh, security in your JavaScript-based applications, security in your HTML pages, and things like that. Defining this is a bit more tricky. Um, the article tries to define this by saying that it's a front-end vulnerability, something that happens without touching the server or the um, the database or the provider, well, um, or without gaining access to these things. Uh, I think that uh, definition is a bit, um, well, not, not very, very uh, accurate. Um, I think front-end security is about a lot more than uh, what the article tries to um, make clear. Essentially, what we're going to talk about here today are client-side security technologies. So you have this whole list of um, new security technologies present in the browser. So we mentioned a lot of them already in previous talks. Um, I haven't gone into detail on content security policy yet, so I'm going to do that here in this talk. Um, some people have asked me some questions about that. I'm going to answer or try to answer them uh, as well. But the real things um, we're going to talk about is why do we have these things? Why are they here? And um, what, what is, is good or, or bad about them? And essentially what it's all about is it's about security tools. So you have a toolbox. The browser has all of these. Sorry, yes. Yes. And our users, but mainly on the server. I mean, we try to do protections in the client side to protect us. Or am I wrong? Um, well, we, we're, doing, we're doing security to protect our applications and, and our users and our data. Oh, yeah. But um, it's, well, uh, uh, well, let's go into detail if you want. A few examples. If, if you do a SQL injection, is that gaining access to a database? Well, you enter some stuff in a form and data comes out, but I, I wouldn't call it access to a database, not necessarily. If you do a DDoS attack, the application goes down, but you never even touch the application, you simply fill up the network. So is that, th yeah. that falls within this definition, but it's not a front-end security problem. And cross-site scripting, you can store cross-site scripting in a database, which means you're already storing stuff in the database, means some, having some access to the database, yet it executes on the front end, and from there it can, can again do whatever it wants. It can start uh, stealing sessions. So it's, it's a very confusing I, I, definition. I mean, I agree with the fact that we have to protect our front end. That's not the point, but the, the definition seems to... But, yeah, now I'm thinking of it. Of course, you also <laughs> want to protect your users and, uh, and 
there are ways to not care about whatever is on the server and just, I mean, yeah. do uh, whatever reflected something from page 15 or whatever to access the user something. So yeah. The main reason I'm mentioning this is because if you talk about front-end security, most people are like, yeah, I'm not really sure what that means or what, what you're trying to get at. And um, in my opinion, this definition also doesn't make it very clear. Um, but um, hopefully after, well, you already probably know quite a bit of it because we covered plenty of these technologies before. So this is what, to me, front-end security is about. It's about um, building a front-end application, much like you build a back-end application, using best practices, using things like uh, separation of privilege uh, and, and those things to actually um, embed security principles right in the application. So um, front-end security is more than simply coding some JavaScript. It's actually building an application, and that's where we, at, where we are at today, and that requires knowledge of technologies like this. Um, that's essentially what it comes down to. Because these things are the tools that you have in the browser, and like, very much like, like a carpenter shop, you need to know how to use these tools. Um, you can mess around with them and, and probably hurt yourself if you're not careful. Um, which actually happens with uh, <laughs> browser security as well. Um, but you need to know how to use them. And if you look at tools like this, they evolve over time. So they, they add security guards to tools. They, they make sure that it becomes more difficult to cut off your hand if you're uh, cutting some wood. So um, actually, with browser security, they do very similar things. And that's what I'm going to talk about here today. So by now, you're here, you have had a full week of second left, you're probably convinced that security is quite important and that you should start doing it. Um, the real question is, where do you get started? With front-end security, there's so many things to, 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 to care about. Uh, Jim talked about stealing OAuth tokens, I talked about uh, cross-site scripting in Angular applications. It, it's a mess, essentially. And it's, it's very difficult to focus your efforts, especially if you're, um, if you're a bit behind on, on the, the security track and you're still like, okay, we, we were stuck in, in the old ages and we want to build uh, new and secure applications, but we have no idea how to do that. So if you look at other areas, for instance, HTTPS, deploying HTTPS, doing it good, um, how, how would you do that? Where do you start? What tools do you use to, to see whether you're doing a good job? Anybody? SSL apps. SSL apps, yes, the SSL server test. This thing gives you a score. If it's lower than an A+, you're probably not doing a very good job. Uh, well, A is also acceptable, but B and below means that you definitely have security problems. It means that you need to start fixing your setup. And this thing has been awesome for deploying or improving your HTTPS deployments. It does, uh, if you don't know it, it's the SSL Ops server test, SSL server test. It simply scans your server, does all of these tests, and gives you a score based on that. And then if you scroll down, I haven't included the full details, if you scroll down, for everything it tested, it, it says what it found, and it gives you some practical advice on how to improve it. For example, if you have, um, if you have SSL version 3 enabled, it will give you a very bad grade because it's vulnerable to the Poodle attack. And you get this whole explanation why this is a problem. And um, if you want, they have some practical advice on how to disable SSL version 3 as well. And this is very, very good. In my opinion, this is uh, one of the major drivers behind um, the deployment of HTTPS today. We have a similar thing for security headers, which is a lot of uh, security technologies in the browser. This is called securityheaders.io. You can enter your website, it scans you, and it gives you uh, some kind of grade. If you look at it in more detail, you get an A. This is a security headers website itself. Um, you get an A and it says like, okay, you have uh, CSP and public key pinning and uh, HSTS and X frame options and blah, blah, blah. You have all of them, check, 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 boom, you get an A. Um, if you have less, then you get obviously a lower score. There's, um, this is very much based on the um, HTTPS, the SSL server test. So it's uh, essentially the same concept, but for security headers. And Mozilla recently launched the observatory. The observatory does something very similar. It does a bit more tests, include third-party tests uh, software as well. And if you scan, if I scan my website, I get a B plus um, with an 80 out of 100, uh, which is, um, well, it doesn't seem very good, but um, it, trust me, it's actually quite okay. <laughs> And they give you some recommended changes, like um, apparently my CSP policy is, is not very good, so I should improve my, uh, my CSP policy. I'll go into that in, in two seconds. So these things seem very, very awesome. Like right? it's, it's like the SSL server test, but they, uh, they do it for security technologies, and they help you build better applications. So they're, first of all, they're absolutely important for awareness. Giving people a grade-based evaluation of your website is the biggest motivator to start improving security. If you go to your manager and you show them and you show an F, 
he's like, oh my God, this is bad. We should fix this. And for the banks, the SSL server, Belgian banks actually had this with the SSL server test. There was this guy who wrote a blog post. He simply ran the server test on all Belgian banks and the scores were bad. He wrote a blog post, post about it and all of a sudden the banks started improving their HTTPS deployments. Uh, simply because of the reputation damage. Somebody starting to write, it's not even relevant what they write because the media will make whatever they want from it. It's like, oh my God, Belgian banks are absurdly insecure. Um, yeah, sure, in a certain uh, context and with a certain nuance, but that's not what people read and that's not how it happens. So, very strong motivator. If you look at, this is the results from uh, an unnamed Belgian bank for security headers. So you scan the website and you get this. So essentially they're doing quite a good job, right? They have a lot of security headers enabled except for public key pinning. I'm gonna go into detail on that and this refer policy which is like a week old. So that, that's okay that they don't have that. Um, it's also, in my opinion, not the most important one. But if you look more closely at the results, this is, these are the, the results from these headers that they have enabled. And just take a look at it and, and try to figure out what it means. And then think about whether they actually deserve a B or not. So anybody, what do you think? CSP is almost empty. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good observation. CSP is empty and actually says the same as, as this header. So, um, well, these are all CSP so, because it used to be a, a development header. So. Um, this one is essentially, this falls away. X, XFO is, is actually quite okay, and these, these ones are okay as well. And strict transport security. But this, this is real, it results in kind of a gaming of the system because CSP, well, you can enable kind of a, a useless directive there, um, yet the headers test says, great, you have CSP, awesome. Um, here's your check, and um, this leads to inflated scores um, simply because of uh, reputation damage, again. And this is also an inherent problem of these tests. How would you evaluate a CSP policy? I talked about CSP before, so the people who were in the talk, how would you evaluate whether a CSP policy is actually secure? That's immensely difficult, right? It, it highly depends on the application. It depends on what kind of attack factors are th there, there are. And that's what makes, um, in my opinion, these scanners uh, a bit more dangerous than the SSL server test. SSL, HTTPS, is largely independent of your application. The only thing that matters is the kind of clients you need to support. And that um, may have, have, have an influence on your score. If you need to support old clients, you will score lower on the SSL server test. Um, for example, Facebook doesn't score very high uh, because they want to support um, everyone. So that's, that's a, a conscious decision. But here, um, it's a lot more complicated. And that's uh, essentially um, part of the topic of this talk. So for example, um, on my website, I. Um, I get this very, very uh, scary warning about CSP that I have unsafe in line, which is definitely not good, um, and I should fix that. So I'm gonna talk a bit about, about uh, why unsafe in line is there. Um, it's less of a problem than you might think, um, but it, it shows you that it's inherently difficult to evaluate such a policy um, against uh, all these kinds of rules. So again, awareness, uh, definitely very important, um, and I, I agree with the fact that these, uh, these things will help uh, in improving uh, security, but people will essentially always game the system. Yeah. Sorry, uh, if I interrupt too much, but uh, so what do you do on your website? I mean, for Nate Plus, I mean, I think you can still have TLS 1 and 1.1. Do you support these? And I mean, I suppose Facebook does this. Um, I suppose they have TLS 1.0 and, and stuff like that to support all browsers. And But the main problem there Um, okay, so you're talking about SSL server test now, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the main drivers for an A plus, um, you need to disable the old, uh, well, old SSL. Um, that's that's one thing. Um, the, I think TLS one is is okay, but the, the most important thing there is um, the cipher suites. Yeah. And uh, if you enable things like RC four, um, you're done. Uh, you're never going to get higher than a B, I think, or even a C. Yeah. Yet there are many clients that don't support anything else. So Facebook opinion is Facebook's opinion is um, in, in all aspects like we're going to try to make it as secure as possible for the modern world, but um, they they support Facebook in Africa and in, in the Philippines in countries where they they actually have um, very old uh, mobile devices and all they do is they have Facebook. 
That's everything. That's the only thing they do on these devices. There's been a survey in these countries to ask people, do you use Facebook and do you use the internet? And more people use Facebook than the internet uh, because they, they simply, they don't see it like the way we see it. They see it like this is Facebook and they don't have this huge internet um, where they do whatever we do on, online. And that's one of the reasons that Facebook is, is so determined to keep supporting these things. That's why the whole SHA-1 uh, certificate story where they are no longer accepted by browsers was a fundamental problem for Facebook. Um, they were very much against that and they, Together with Cloudflare, they actually worked out a solution to keep supporting SHA-1 certificates in, in some kind of a legacy mode. So um, that, that all comes into play if you're uh, a major player like Facebook. Well, would you, would you say that you can get, you can just switch off the OS1 and one plus one? <laughs> I mean, um, do you? I mean, for, for your business? That, that's a very good question. Uh, it's like you I configure it and... <laughs> No, I, I disable SSL version 3. I think SSL 1.0 is still, is still enabled um, because it, it's, it's essentially okay. The strength of, of your, um, well, the, the, the attacks against... Uh, I mean, the attacks are implemented. Yeah, but the attacks you're talking about uh, against SHA-1 and RC4 um, are essentially part of uh, specific cipher suites, which you can disable independently of uh, DLS 1.1 uh, or 1.2 or whatever. Yeah. Okay, but we, we can talk more about that uh, offline if you want. We can scan my website and see what comes out of it. Uh, I, I don't remember by heart. It's, it's been a, a while since I've given a training on that, so um, I don't remember the exact settings. Okay, but these security scanners, especially for client-side uh, security technologies, um, again, awareness, very important. But if you, if you look at what, what the results are, you, you get all of these questions, like how do you know if you want to deploy this, whether you got it right, the security scanner won't tell you. Uh, with the SSL server test, it probably will tell you like, dude, what the hell, you're still supporting ciphers that should, uh, should have been gone uh, five years ago. Here, if you enable your CSP with like a, a void policy, the thing still says, great job, buddy, um, keep doing it. How do you know you covered it all? If the scanner doesn't cover it, you don't either. Um, so this, this is just to show you that, um, that these things are not a holy grail when it comes down to front-end security. Um, the real answer is knowledge. And uh, I, I keep repeating this because it's so very important. If you don't know what these things do, if you don't know and, or understand how they work, it's going to be very hard to actually configure them in a secure way and get any guarantees from your application. But the good thing is you guys are here. So that's um, essentially step number one. So in the, this was the introduction. In the middle part of my, my presentation here, I want to give you some some case studies. So we're going to look at, uh, I think, four specific technologies. Um, I'm not going to go into full details on how they work. Um, I've covered most of that in, in previous sessions, uh, except CSP. I'm going to go into real detail there because I haven't done that yet. I'm going to give you a quick overview of what it does, what the goal is, and then we're going to talk about very specific problems that have popped up since these technologies have been introduced. The first one. By the way, if you have any questions, again, uh, feel free to interrupt me. Um, we're going to uh, have some interesting discussions about that, if, if that's relevant. So the first one is strict transport security. Well, maybe a good question first. Does everybody know what this thing does? Who, who doesn't? No, I see some people nodding no. OK, so that's, that's fine. Let me introduce that in one slide. There's a lot, of more, a lot more detail in that um, than, than what I'm going to show here. If you want to know more about that, come talk to me or watch one of the recordings um, in a couple of weeks when it's online. Well, actually, no, it's, it's not recorded. I did this during the hands-on, so it, there's no recording of that. Um, that's fine. Um, for the video, you can always uh, invite me to come talk about that in your company. So <laughs> that's OK. Essentially, what HSTS does, um, the goal of HSTS is when you have a website deployed over HTTPS, um, it's going to help you avoid that anybody still goes to the HTTP version inadvertently. And this is important because if you're on an unprotected network, uh, like the network here, um, somebody might intercept this first HTTP request, which will actually result in a redirect to the HTTPS version of the website. That's what, what it comes down in a nutshell. It works like this. You have a browser and you have a server. Um, the server can configure the strict transport security policy and give you a max age. And the max age essentially says, for the, in this case, for the coming year, browser, remember that you should send HTTPS to me. 
And whenever you're thinking about sending HTTP, remember, this should be HTTPS and switch it automatically. Um, I'm cool with that. And that's essentially what this policy does. It's conceptually, it's very simple. So this is website.be. So if you set that policy and the user um, types in website.be or HTTP uh, colon slash slash website.be, the browser will make it HTTPS, just like that. The browser knows, whoa, strict lines for security, very cool. I'm gonna use HTTPS instead of the default HTTP, which will trigger a redirect anyway and whatever. So essentially you get rid of that redirect by configuring the browser. That's, that's all there is to it. There's a second flag, include subdomains, which does exactly what the name suggest, suggests. If you go to a subdomain of website.be, um, the browser knows, include subdomains, website.be, boom, HTTPS automatically, and you have your protected channel. This means that if somebody wants to mess with this traffic, you, have, you need to have a position in a, well, an HTTPS man in the middle, which is very difficult to get if you don't get a valid certificate. So that's essentially what it comes down to. Usage. There's this Mozilla project that scans the top uh, 1,000 websites, um, which are, of course, the, the major websites. They do a better job than the rest of the internet, so the stats are um, an optimistic upper bound uh, of this deployment. In 2015, uh, about 4.5% used HSTS. In 2016, 12%, uh, which is definitely a major improvement. Yes? Is uh, 4% or 12% of uh, the ones that use HTTPS or 4,000? That is a very good question. Um, I suppose it's from, from the top 1,000 websites. So not only, but I, I can't imagine that one of, well, okay. Um, there's probably going to be some that don't use HTTPS, uh, for sure. But um, I don't think they, they make a distinction between that because they have stats for other headers as well, which are <coughs> independent of HTTPS. So it's going to be 4% uh, and 12% of the top 1,000. So HSTS added in 2012. What can go wrong? Um, of course, when new technology is introduced, people start looking at it, uh, start being creative, and they find all kinds of ways to do nasty things. One of these nasty things is history sniffing, which HSTS. And CSP uh, plays a role in here. Um, not too important to understand details about CSP to understand the attack here. So essentially, what happened is you have a browser with a, with a page. This is the, the sniffing page. And you have a website uh, sitting on the internet somewhere. And you have, um, well, you have two websites. And you have one with HSTS enabled and one with not a, no HSTS enabled. So that means that requests here, HTTP requests, will be upgraded to HTTPS. And here they will not be upgraded. They will stay HTTP. What actually, what, what people figured out is if you load an image over HTTP from one of these websites, you can do some de error detection when the image doesn't load. And you can use that for a timing attack. So let's try to load the image over HTTP. Well, um, and here we do the same, but the image here will be loaded over HTTPS. So how can you abuse that? Um, keep bear, bear with me. This is uh, very sneaky. You configure a CSP policy where you say, I only want images to be loaded over HTTP. I never ever want an image loaded over HTTPS. So you see where this is going? So you have CSP. CSP will allow this request and will block this request. Because this one is blocked in the browser, this returns immediately. If you load the image, like a nanosecond later, boom, error, error. CSP says, no way, you're not allowed to do that. While here, you have the network request that comes back, so there's some latency, latency in there as well, unless it's cached, of course. So with this, you can actually start um, building a history of HSTS sites that the user has visited, because this only works when the browser knows that HSTS is enabled. So that's uh, actually a, a very sneak attack that somebody came up with. And as you know, um, you probably know this from the, the, the style attribute for visited links. When the link turns purple, you could inspect the color and see which, uh, which websites the user has visited. Uh, they consider that to be a serious problem, and they actually consider this to be a problem as well. So this is one um, very nasty attack using uh, HSTS to steal information from the user's history. Um, this is called Sniffly. Um, the tool is, is available on GitHub. You can find it here. Um, and essentially, it, um, it simply tries this on, on 100 or 500 websites with HSTS enabled, and they see whatever comes back, and they know, OK, this user has been there, 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 and there. Um, the problem is these kind of attacks are, are a bit inherent to the way HSTS works. So it's very hard to prevent this from happening. Um, the thing they did for now, so uh, the people reported this to Chrome, and um, the, the people from Google are also um, working on the spec for CSP. So they actually um, decided to, that it doesn't make sense for CSP to lock 
um, your CSP policy to insecure resources uh, only. So they actually said, well, uh, this is kind of nonsensical on, on the modern web where we want everything to be HTTPS. So if you do this as a whitelist, they actually, um, when an HTTPS request comes along, they actually um, allow that to go through as well. So essentially, it, a whitelist for HTTP only becomes this, uh, this instead. So this is a kind of a workaround. Um, the people from the tool found other ways to attack or to carry out the same attack as well. So um, it's not entirely gone, but it's, it's better. Uh, Yes? I'm not sure I understand the threat model that this uh, attack is, uh, is in. So, uh, so does the attacker have to be, have, have access to the user account um, in order to run the browser and attack to the user account? Absolutely not. The only thing you need to be able to do, you need to visit a page under control of the attacker. Because at this page, the attacker simply starts, well, the attacker sets a CSP policy. You can do that from a meta tag, so that's easy to do. Um, the attacker can in start injecting images and simply watch the timings, and that's it. So in general, this is, for instance, uh, I can load this on my blog, and, and if all of you go get the slides there, um, I can see what HSCS sites you have been visiting. That's, that's a threat model. Anybody else? So, wonderful technologies, but of course on the web it's never that easy. It always becomes messy somehow. A second problem with HSTS um, requires me to uh, explain a bit more about how it works. So, this thing works very good. So, once you have uh, configured this policy, you get the protection that you want. But the first time you go to this website, you don't know yet whether it supports HSTS. The website has to configure this on the first response. So, the first request, if you go to this website and you don't know, you don't type HTTPS explicitly, the first request will be HTTP, meaning that it can still be attacked. This is called a trust on first use issue, um, which is um, very common in, in these kinds of protection mechanisms. So there's a solution for that. And the solution is preloading. And with preloading, you actually tell, um, you, you have this, this list of websites that say, I support HSTS and I want to support this for a very long time, so I'm gonna put myself into the browser. And this preload list is deployed with all of your browsers today. So all of your browsers have a hard-coded list of websites that have vouched to use HSTS. It's a messy mechanism, I agree, but it works for now. So you can register yourself, you can be put on the list, and um, from then on, you are um, preloaded by default, and the browser knows from the very first request that you want to use HTTPS. To be able to Put, to be put on the list, you need to opt into this mechanism. They, they don't want to simply allow everybody to start uh, putting sites on that list um, because that will become very problematic if I put your website on there and you don't support HTTPS um, or don't support all pages over HTTPS, you're in trouble. Yes? Is that similar to a HTTPS everywhere though? Yes, exactly. So this mechanism is the by design mechanism to um, allow behavior like HTTPS everywhere. Um, so, okay. Very good question, a bit of history. Um, these kinds of attacks were um, no, well, discovered in, in the mid 2000s. Um, uh, some guy, Moxie Marlinspike, wrote the, the tool set to actually carry them out automatically in uh, 2008, if I'm not mistaken. And HSTS was only uh, proposed and, and well, it was only um, implemented in browsers in 2012. So uh, until then there was no protection against these kind of attacks. So um, tools like Force HTTPS and HTTPS Everywhere and whatever these browser add-ons actually try to mimic this behavior, absolutely. Um, so this thing achieves the same, but now it's under control of the server instead of under control of the user. Okay. So to be put on the list, you need to consent to it. You need to add this preload flag to your header. Otherwise, um, anybody can add any website to this preload list, which is definitely not a good situation to be in. It turns out, sorry, no? Yeah. I didn't trust that, sorry. Okay. Yeah, so, wait, let me, let me skip to the next slide first. So if you want to be put on the preload list, you go to this website and you say, um, website.be, um, I want to be put on the list. And if this website, well, I was gonna tell that uh, in the next slide, but this website will check certain things and when, when it says it's okay, it will actually put your name, well, put your website on that list. That list will end up in the, the next uh, dev release from Chrome and after a couple of months, I think the release cycle is three months, 
it will be deployed to every user on every Chrome user. Simply a text file saying. Yes, so they check indeed whether the, the preload flag is there, um, whether you consented to it. That's, that's what it comes down to. So when you specify a header, you, they, they check whether your max age is, is long enough, for example. If you set it to one day, they're, they're like, yeah, with all due respect, but that's not useful, so we're not going to add you to the list uh, anyway. So they check the presence of this preload flag. And the preload flag acts as this intent mechanism, like I as an administrator, I am aware that I'm going to do this, so uh, this, this is okay. However, it turns out, this was from a couple of months ago, that a lot of websites actually have this preload flag but are not on the preload list and not even on the development version of the preload list. So um, what turns out, they, somebody started investigating this, um, well, it turns out that this comes from, um, from copy-pasting configs in, in uh, sheet sheets and stuff like that. So they actually found um, the, 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 the header that the OWASP sheet sheet suggests to add, and people simply copy-paste it in their Nginx config, and they, they do it like that. But the problem is, um, in theory, this allows to anyone to put you on the preload list, even if your config is not, um, not up to it. And the bigger problem is, um, the lucky thing is that the, the site actually checks certain things, so if you don't include, include subdomains here, um, you will not be ele eligible uh, to put on the, on the preload list. But the real problem is, um, once you're on there, you cannot turn it off anymore. So HSTS, you can turn it off by setting the max H to zero. So if I turn it on and I screw myself, next time you come, I set it to zero and your browser forgets the setting. But if it's preloaded, it never forgets it. So you cannot turn it off anymore and you're in, definitely in some trouble. So fortunately, the website checks certain things before um, you can be added. But still, um, this is something that, um, that is problematic in, in practice because essentially, um, you find bug reports to, uh, for people asking to be taken off of the preload list. Um, and you find reports like this. Um, apparently someone added my site to this list. Okay, whoops, uh, that's, <laughs> that's a problem if you don't want this. Um, but it's only possible because these guys added the preload flag there without knowing what it does apparently. They simply copy paste it, oh yeah, it works, fine. Uh, until someone adds you and you're definitely screwed. And there are plenty of examples here. Um, apparently Uber was on the list as well. Um, they wanted to be taken off because they had some issues with, uh, with subdomains, um, because they, they enabled include subdomains. But again, once you're on there, you're in trouble. So, um, yeah. Um, it started by, by the people behind Chrome, um, but now all browsers support it. So I think, it's, uh, I think the main version is still maintained by, by the people behind Chrome. Yes. So it, it's, it used to be Google only, but uh, Firefox joined, and now all browsers, even IE 11, um, they all, all use this preload list. Um, of course, the speed when, uh, between picking up new items from the list and removing old items completely depends on the release cycle of the browser. So if you release a new version every year, then it takes one year to be put on the list, and one year, well, depending on when you ask um, to be taken off again. Chrome has this very rapid release cycle, so it's every three months that the list is updated, um, so that um, that kind of determines it. Preload is um, for preload. I don't know exactly. IE eleven does the, the preload list and, and the other browsers were, um, are also there, so it's, it's been for a while like that. And HSTS is actually well supported. It's uh, Chrome 4, Firefox 4, so that's, that's like an eternity ago. Um, and the other browsers are fairly, doing fairly well as well. I, I can look it up if you want to. Um, I don't know by heart, I haven't included it here. Let me see if I, yeah, uh, no thanks. So, it's fairly well supported. So, um, essentially, this is uh, Safari, is Safari 7, IE 11, uh, all Edge browsers support it. Um, so, it's definitely, definitely well supported. You have some mobile browsers that have less support for it, but uh, Chrome, Chrome has support for it uh, as well. So it's, it's definitely uh, fairly well supported. Thank you. 
All right. So problems, Uber had one, and this is <laughs> even the, the most serious one. This is uh, someone who, who turned it on. Uh, somebody convinced him to enable HSTS. It wasn't me, I promise. Uh, <laughs> um, but apparently his ads were blocked because of mixed content issues and he wanted to disable that again. And the Chrome team was like, yeah, with all due respect, it's gonna take about three months. Uh, yeah, so it happens. So some practical advice up front: If you wanna enable preload, run HSTS without preload for a while and see what happens. Um, this, you can always disable it when you're running it yourself. And if you're okay with it after half a year, a year, maybe then it's time to, to be added to the preload list. Um, but don't make very quick decisions here because it's hard to turn them back. Any questions? All right, I was scared that most of you would know all of the details, but it's, it's good that there are these questions, so it, it's, it's interesting. Second one, public key pinning. Uh, it's again in the, in the space of HTTPS. Um, Maybe uh, this is probably the, the ser most serious case of how things can take a turn for the worst. Um, but let me explain what public key pinning is first um, before we go on with the problems. Public key pinning is all about this. This is um, somebody in, in, I think it's in Iran, um, who went to Google. And Google, well, these countries, um, they like to man in the middle connections from their citizens to see what they're doing because they don't like you having Gmail and they want to see what mails you're sending uh, because they want to uh, make sure you adhere to what they think is a sensible uh, user policy. So whatever, they try to man in the middle as much as possible from these connections. Google didn't like this very much. They don't like people um, sitting in between them and, uh, and their users. So what they actually did is they um, they control Chrome and they control Gmail, so they actually hard-coded the keys for Gmail in Chrome. So they said, whenever you initiate a connection with Gmail or with Google.com, the connection should use these keys. If you see something else, this is not okay and it should give an SSL warning, which is essentially what you get here. So you connected to Google.com, the certificate was invalid. It was actually valid, but not uh, according to Chrome. Chrome simply says, not the right key, I'm gonna um, throw this nasty error. And the guy posted this on Google forums and they started uh, investigating what was going on. And they asked him to post some details about the SSL certificate and this is what came out. So he posted this certificate, it's for start at google.com, which is already a bit fishy. Um, and it came from Diginotag. Um, by now you may remember that Diginotag is this Dutch CA, was this Dutch CA, um, who didn't uh, know very much about security apparently and they got hacked and somebody actually generated a certificate for Google services which was being, being used in the wild. So this is how public key pinning started. Google um, simply did it themselves for their own services um, to detect these kind of things and to prevent it from happening. Um, yeah. Isn't this undermining the proof that we put in here? If Google starts putting themselves on the list, I mean, I mean, it's a certificate pin, but. Uh, well. Yeah, in this case. It's, it's actually, it's, it's a countermeasure to, to well, it's, it's an augmentation to the, the trust we put in CAs. We trust way too many CAs. Your browser trusts 300 of them from all over the world, Chinese ones. And there's no restriction on which CA can sign what. No, no, sure, right. And that's, that's one of the problems. With that too, but the fact that Google starts putting, okay, we have to trust Google anyway. Yeah, but they do it for their own, their own stuff. It's, it's not like they're gonna pin um, the certificates for, for your website or my website if I would be important enough. Um, so they're doing it for their own stuff and I, I think that's, that's quite okay. Um, so I, I don't see that much of a problem with that. Anyway, this is how this started. So that's what, what key pinning is about. And this turned into something like, which is called HTTP public key pinning. And essentially it's the same mechanism, but of course with a configuration header. So you can set this header from your website. You can say public key pins, remember this for uh, this number of seconds. And these are the keys that I wanna use. If you see something else, that's not okay. Um, very much like HSTS, it's meant to be used in combination by the way. Um, this allows you to prevent somebody from getting a valid certificate for your website and man in the middle link HTTPS connections using that. Essentially what it does is it associates your host name with a cryptographic identity. So you can pin your own public key, you can pin the key of the CA you're using, so you can, um, that, that pin is valid for multiple certificates uh, from that CA. So you can decide at what level you wanna lock this down um, because you have to choose between being very specific and being a bit more resilient and having some freedom in uh, which keys you want to use. I can show you a quick schematic of how this works. 
So you have a server with a certain public key and you have a browser. If you make a connection, the server will send you a valid certificate. So you need to have a valid connection before the key pinning works. And it sends you a key pin and the key pin will be stored in the browser. When you go to the website again, you get a valid certificate. The browser will check the key in this certificate against the pins here. And if it matches, everything is fine. If it doesn't match, you get an error. And this means that if somebody, an attacker, sets up a fake server for your web shop um, with his own key, because of course he cannot steal your key, if he can do that, it's a whole different story, any man in the middle is the connection. He gets a valid certificate for that. So he hacks the he notepad, gets a certificate for that, and he man in the middle is your web shop. At that point, the browser will verify that certificate, um, verify the key associated with that, but this key will not match this pin, so the browser will say, no, this is not okay. And you get this SSL error um, in the browser. Okay? This seems like a very cool thing, right? Um, very powerful, um, helps you detect uh, things from the NSA and stuff like that. Um, well, people don't use it very much, that's, that's number one. Um, and you also see this, this downward trend. This is not a mistake. Um, so people didn't use it before and um, even less people use it today. One of the reasons is this. Um, public key pinning is very, very powerful. Um, Smashing Magazine actually used it. Um, and they also shot themselves in the foot um, and they barely survived. So um, essentially what happened here is they managed to knock their site offline for four days um, because they rotated their pins uh, without really thinking it through or without really understanding how it worked. And actually, to be honest, many people were surprised that this happened and uh, many people didn't think of this uh, upfront either. So um, even uh, people very intimate with public key pinning were like, oh, right, um, that's definitely a problem. And the only thing they did is they had these pins, they pinned a certain key, then the certificate was about to expire, so they generated a new key, a new certificate, and they pinned a new key. But they, they pinned it for a year, meaning that if you went to the website, before um, the rotation started, you never got a new pin, um, and after expiration, of course, you could not connect to it because you didn't have the new pin for the new certificate. So essentially, a lot of users could not connect anymore. They managed to recover from this um, because they found their old key in a backup somewhere, and they were able to get a new certificate with the old key. So you can, um, well, it, you don't need to generate a new key to get a new certificate, you can use an old key. So they get a new certificate for the old key, which still matched the pin, and they were able to reset the mechanism through that. Um, but it's, it's very dangerous. This is a very powerful mechanism. Unlike HSTS, HSTS is, is, can, works on any valid HTTPS connection, that, so that's a lot less dangerous. But this one, if you get it wrong, it's, it's game over, essentially. If they wouldn't have their old key, if it would be revoked, if they would have deleted it or whatever, um, they would have a lot of users who would unable to be unable to connect for the coming year, which is kind of serious. But, uh, the, the, the max age is, is just fixed from the moment that someone received the header the first time, right? So how do you do that? So you have to change the max age depending on the closer you get to your... That, that would be, but that would be one way, yes. Another way is you should always pin a backup key, always. When you start pinning, one of the first things you should do is generate a key, print it out, put it in a safe, and make sure that nobody can touch that. If anything, is go anything goes wrong, ever, you still have the second key um, that is pinned. You can get a certificate with that key, and then um, you can start, well, you get your up and running again. It's, it's up to you, it depends. Um, it depends on the lifetime of the certificate. So if you have very short-lived certificates, um, it doesn't hurt to reuse your key. If you have a certificate for five years, then um, it's probably not, not a very good idea to keep reusing the same key for crypt analysis and, and whatnot. Um, but again, that's out of my um, comfort zone, so um, that's, that's more part stuff. Anyway, this is dangerous, and this is even without the presence of the attacker. Sorry, yes. Yes. Yeah, so you need to, to get the pins first. Um, why? Why do you ask? So I was wondering why that didn't work. Okay. Do you see a problem with, with this trust on first use? Just push the pin in the middle the first time. Pinning the wrong pin. Yeah. Does it work? No, well, 
they don't call it DOS, they, they call it Ransom PKP. <laughs> so essentially, what can go wrong? Indeed, uh, ver very good, um, awesome observation. If you go the first time to the attacker, the attacker can set his own pin stored by the browser, and the next time you go to your legitimate web shop, the browser says, no, 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 uh, this is not the right key. And this is essentially um, something that, again, people thought of after the thing was, was deployed, and they're like, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> and they call it actually ransom PKP, because you can do that, um, well, you, you can do this with two pins. One pin to, um, to, to pin the current key, to lock the user out of the legitimate website, and the second pin is the ransom pin. So the second pin is the one you sell to the website to regain their users. So um, this is, <laughs> yeah, this, you laugh at this, but if this happens to you, this is not funny. Because it's uh, essentially, if you don't pay the ransom, you can throw your domain name away. If your user's got the key, then, then you're screwed. So it depends on, well, people actually envision this. If you break into this web shop, instead of stealing the data, you simply install the pin, let it run for a while, and then you contact them and like, yeah, you owe us a bit of money. And um, it's probably gonna work. Uh, that's the sad thing about it. Did that happen to a while? Did it happen or is it a theoretical? Um, I, I'm not aware of actual, uh, Actual cases. This is uh, people uh, cooked this up for for a black hat presentation. Um, maybe they tried it out. I don't know, <laughs> but I, I'm not aware of actual cases where this happened. Um, I, I don't think that victim should be seen to advertise. <laughs> yeah, that, that's also that's also true. Um, but yeah. Theoretically, if it's a large enough website, it will end up in the media within well many seconds. I think. <laughs> yeah, because it becomes. It, it depends on how they set it up, because if they do that, of course, then they can also steal the, the lockout key. Well, they can, well, steal, they can get it from their own server, so. Um, it, it depends, it's, it's messy, it's possible, um, but the main message here is HPKP is actually very, very dangerous. Um, it's also the reason that um, things like security headers and the SSL server test are moving away from that. So they were considering of requiring HPKP for an A plus grade on the SSL server test, um, but they, they don't, and there are no plans to do that anymore because they consider it to be something um, that's, well, I have, I have a point about that. They consider that to be a problem for um, high profile sites, things like WikiLeaks, they, they may want to deploy public key pinning. Um, your website, probably not. Um, it's, it's, it protects against a very specific kind of attack um, which requires a lot of capabilities to pull off and in general, it's not going to be a problem for your website. Uh, that's what it comes down to. Um, also, it, it's a very difficult problem to solve. Hostile pinning is, is not something you, you solve easily. So um, that's an inherent problem to what the spec offers, and that's also why people are, are moving away uh, from things like that, and they are advocating something like certificate transparency to be used instead. It's, um, so, you, so does your website need HPKP uh, enabled for the attack to work? I mean, if you man enable it, as on the slide that we showed? No, no, the attacker can do it, can do it himself as well. Yeah. So the, the reason they, yeah, of course. So the reason they don't consider it to be um, mandatory is they, they don't want, well, it's a smashing magazine case, essentially. They don't want people to shoot themselves in the foot, but a man in the middle can always enable it as well. Um, Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, no, um, public key pinning requires a valid HTTPS connection, and when you have HSTS enabled, then it's, it's gonna force HTTPS anyway, and if that fails, um, pinning will not go through because the connection will simply be dropped. So the man in the middle, I mean, the, the attacker needs a valid connection. Yeah, so if you have HSTS enabled already, then the attacker f definitely needs, um, needs a, a, valid, um, a valid key anyway, or he can break into your server and do it from there. And simply configure the lockout pin, wait until enough users have it, and then uh, pull it off from your server, and then start asking you for, the for money. Well, it de depends on the site you're running oh, yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, but in, in general, yes. All right, case number three, this is a short one, um, XXSS protection, which is actually, um, this is all about 
automatic browser-based cross-site scripting protection. So um, maybe most of you have heard about this. Essentially what it comes down to is um, IE, Chrome, and Safari, they all have this um, XSS detection mechanism. So they, they detect reflected cross-site scripting attacks. And a reflected cross-site scripting attack, essentially you have a payload which is present in uh, the URL of the body order of the request. So you make a request to a server, um, you include a, a piece of malicious script in, in the URL, for example, and it comes back in the response in the page um, and is executed by the browser. So this is something that um, this, is, uh, this requires um, to, well, this is difficult to reach a lot of users with this because you need, every user needs to be able to load this very specific payload in the URL. Uh, in contrast to a, a stored cross-site scripting where you put it in a database and it's served to all of your users. So that's, that's the main difference here. Nonetheless, reflected cross-site scripting is definitely a problem. So IE8 started this, uh, with this a long time ago. They, it's called XSS filter in IE. In Chrome and Safari, it's called XSS auditor. This is also the reason why if I do a lab on cross-site scripting, people have to use Firefox because otherwise this thing gets in the way. Uh, so it, it works, but it works as a defense in depth mechanism. It's not a core security feature for, against cross-site scripting. So you should do your normal cross-site scripting protections, but this thing simply kicks in. If it detects something, um, it's an additional layer of security. It's gonna try to block it up front uh, before it even becomes a problem. Note that, um, first of all, these things can be bypassed. Um, they're always going to be bypassed. Um, the, the, the people that created that acknowledge this. Um, they say it's not meant to be uh, a foolproof mechanism. It's just meant to raise the bar and to make sure that uh, cross-site scripting becomes just a little bit harder. You can configure this mechanism. It's on by default in the browsers. You can configure this with the XXSS protection header. And there are a few settings you can use there. Um, so the default behavior is the browser will scan the request, scan the response, and if it detects something, it will try to uh, re re will rewrite the page and try to um, either take out the payload or render it harmless or do something like that. So there are three settings here. So some guy, uh, some cross-site scripting uh, bug hunter did a, did a poll, like what's, what's the best setting for this, this header? And this is what, what answers he got, so. There doesn't appear to be much consensus about how to configure this, configure this header. You can either turn it off, turn it on, or put it in blocking mode. And about one third of the people think each of these settings is a good one. So what's up with that? <laughs> how it works, um, this is mainly uh, in, in IE. How it works in IE, it's with a, with a regex. So um, they build a regex to detect uh, potentially dangerous payloads in, in requests, uh, requests going out, and then they scan the response to find that payload. This is how they detect an applet. Um, this, this seems uh, fairly, fairly uh, readable. If you know a bit of regex stuff, like uh, if you have some characters, uh, the word applet and some stuff in there, that's, that seems fine. This is how they detect script tags. Um, if you can read this, um, you're probably a Perl guy from, from a very long time ago. Um, this is absolutely insane, but it works, more or less. What's the problem here? The problem is, um, let me show you. You can trick IE into rewriting harmless code into cross-site scripting code. So uh, the, the attacker can inject something that the website will not consider to be harmful, so it will allow it to be in there. And it, it's actually not harmful, so you can inject, let's say this is the injector vector. So you have the alt tag for a script, uh, for an image, sorry. So this is simply something that's displayed if the image is not loaded. This is uh, for accessibility reasons, for example. And the attacker injects X space unload alert zero space X. The server sanitizes or encodes the whole thing and it's like, yeah, this is fine. It's, it's between quotes, so I don't care. And he allows this to go through. And then, <coughs> of course, this was present in, in the URL, for example. IE says like, whoa, unload, that looks very, very dangerous. Um, let me um, take a look at that and let me uh, f configure it. So it's, it actually inserts this hashtag here instead of the, the equals. So it makes this attribute harmless, but actually by doing so, the browser will look at this as a new attribute and it will actually execute this alert um, on, on when the image is loaded. So there are uh, plenty of uh, a few other cases as well. This was the, the easiest one I could find to explain. Um, so if you want to know more, look, look it up. The post is, um, contains uh, plenty of other examples and uh, this is definitely um, a bit of a problem. Which brings me to the, the configuration of the header. So what, what do you do? How, how do you tackle this? Um, should you turn it off or not. Well, one thing you can do is um, 
you can block the page when uh, something malicious is detected. So this is the default mode of operation. If you block a page when, when something bad happens, um, IE and Chrome will not, well, Chrome doesn't do it like this. IE will not try to rewrite. IE will simply say, no, done. Page is not loaded, blank page, um, essentially about, uh, about colon blank, and that's it. Um, we're done, this is something dangerous and you shouldn't be doing it. Seems like a good idea, right? Facebook doesn't agree with you. Why? Because somebody actually um, attacked Facebook with this. Well, they, they found an attack and they got some money for it. So what did they do? They chained a couple of uh, problems together and they were able to extract all our tokens using um, the blocking mode of the XXSS protection uh, header. So essentially they got $5,000 for it from Facebook and they actually uh, caused Chrome to patch their browser to avoid this from happening in the future, even though it was actually uh, a Facebook problem. So in response, Facebook turns XXSS protection off. They simply set it to zero. And the reason, first of all, they have a very solid uh, defense mechanism against cross-site scripting attacks in place, so they're actually pretty sure, sure that they don't have reflected cross-site scripting because of the way they built their pages, which is uh, very good. And they decide that it's better to turn it off than to risk some uh, flaky uh, uh, bugs to uh, cause a certain compromise. And what actually happened here, um, I'm not gonna go into full details, again, here's the link if you wanna know more. Uh, what actually happens is, because of the blocking, um, the page got this about, uh, about blank or, uh, URL. And about blank inherits the origin of the parent page, meaning that the parent page can inspect the frame that, uh, that was blocked from loading. And the frame contained a document refer uh, property. And that was the last seen URL, uh, but in this case, they were doing an OAuth flow, and as Jim said yesterday, OAuth flows have tokens in the URLs. So this URL all of a sudden contained user tokens for OAuth. So they could steal that and use that to uh, access the user's account and get information from there. So this is um, the chaining of a lot of stuff together um, to actually abuse these features and get some um, sensitive information out of that. So Facebook turns it off, um, that's one thing, and Chrome actually, when the page is blocked, Chrome now uh, gives it a unique origin instead of simply about, uh, about blank and uh, essentially solves this, uh, this potential attack vector. So yes, client-side security is messy. I'm, I'm coming to that um, in the, the, the the conclusion, but essentially, in most cases, blocking mode is fine. Um, so uh, setting it to one one block is, is okay. Um, if you're absolutely sure, well, it's it's better to depend on the protection than to um, to fear this very exotic attack uh, that might be possible. That, that's my opinion. Um, unless you're absolutely sure that you don't have reflected cross-site scripting, then you can turn it off as well. But it, it depends, it depends. For example, Dropbox, um, they're also pretty sure that they don't suffer from that, so um, they, they actually, it's, again, it's, it has to do with the way they build pages. They do escaping up front. And they're pretty sure that they cover everything um, because of the way they do it. And that's uh, why you could choose to turn it off. That brings me, yeah, I'm gonna have to pee after the talk. But if you talk about drinking, it's kind of important, so. That brings me to the fourth case study, content security policy. This is actually the most extensive one. I may have to pick up the speed a bit um, if I want to get through it, but um, that's going to be fine. So, who here has heard of content security policy? Okay, most of you. Who here understands what it does? <laughs> All right, uh, I, I, see, I see a couple of you. Uh, one of the guys was in my training, so uh, that, that's a good thing. Um, so, CSP is it's very complex. Um, it's been to various versions in a very short time. Um, so I, I'm gonna walk you through the process. I'm gonna walk you through uh, version one until version three where we are now. I'm gonna, gonna explain to you why they changed it and why um, these changes are actually important. To be honest, the latest version is actually quite good. Um, they got rid of a lot of uh, complicated stuff and they actually um, made it very elegant, in my opinion. What is CSP about? CSP is about content security policy in the first the first and foremost goal is to, uh, to be a second layer of defense against cross-site scripting. So with CSP, again, you have all of these dangerous scripts in your page. You have some script here, some script here, script here, and script here. 
If I ask you which scripts belong there and which don't, you would be able to answer this, more or less, right? This is not, not so difficult, like, hmm, a script in, in a header, hmm, probably not very, very good. Um, on click, that looks, uh, certainly looks uh, fine. Some evil.com, hackme.js, hmm, probably you don't want to load that either. But a browser doesn't know. A browser has no idea. If you give this page to a browser, he's like, yeah, I've seen a lot of stuff. I'm absolutely not sure uh, whether this is something uh, a normal user would not do or a normal developer would not. Believe me, it happens. So CSP is actually aimed um, at giving you control over what happens in your page. It's aimed at preventing stuff like this uh, or stuff like these injections to do harm. And that's where it comes from. It came, um, um, came from a re research paper from Mozilla. It's actually an idea that has been floating around before that. So it's, it's been an, has been an idea for a while. But in 2010, people actually uh, came up with, with a, a formal definition of what CSP is and an implementation in Firefox back then. So what is CSP? Like I said, it's uh, defense in depth against injection attacks, not a replacement for your XSS mitigation techniques, very important. Um, and what it does is it places two kinds of restrictions on a page. First of all, um, it removes dangerous features like inline scripts. I'm gonna show you an example in the next slide. And it installs this whitelist to, con to give you control over what resources can be loaded. It's very extensive. Um, they added all kinds of stuff in there, um, which in my opinion is maybe not the best idea. But we'll, we're going to talk about this cross-site scripting stuff first. How does it work? Let's say you have uh, a page. Somebody injects this inline script block um, somewhere that uh, user input uh, should be. By default, CSP blocks this. Inline script blocks, yet. I won't execute it. Um, this is not cool. You should put your scripts in JavaScript files and don't embed them in your HTML. This is actually simply a good coding practice, um, which not many people follow. Second thing, remote scripts can, be, can happen as well. Somebody can, can inject something like this. Um, CSP said, well, in that case, you have to whitelist this. If you want to load this, that's fine. You can do that. But whitelist this up front, and then I'll decide whether to do this or not. So in, in essence, if this is a script from you, you will whitelist this, and the CSP will load it. If it's something the attacker injected, the uh, CSP will not whitelist this, and um, the browser will block this for you. That's what CSP is about, CSP version 1, uh, mind you. So how do you do this? Um, essentially, you have these directives like script SRC, so you can say content security policy, it's a header. Uh, you can do it from a meta tag as well, um, but I, I'm not gonna go into detail on that. So script SRC, self means from my own web, uh, my own origin, and I want stuff from example.com, over HTTPS of course, and I want uh, stuff from every subdomain of website.be. So you have uh, kind of freedom to do what you want there. You have keywords, none means not ever, uh, you can say object SRC, I'm not ever, I, I don't want anything uh, for that. Um, you have self, you have star. Host expressions are very flexible as well. You have a host, you have a scheme only, you have a, a specific file, you can have a wildcard for subdomains and things like that. So if you have our code example from before, this is what would happen. So this thing would be uh, kicked out, this is an attack, inline script block, gone. Uh, remote script, we don't whitelist this, gone. Um, of course, our own code, um, gone probably, inline script block, not cool, and uh, on click handler, inline script, uh, not cool. So you can see CSP starts um, breaking your web application, so to say. So what you should do is you should actually externalize the script, so you should create this, um, this script file containing your code to add an event listener instead of writing on click. Again, good coding style, bad coding style, but uh, CSP kind of enforces you to use that good coding style. And then you should load that script uh, explicitly, you should whitelist your own uh, origin, and then um, you can load this script file. That's what the first version of CSP is about. Think about your applications. Would this be compatible with CSP? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, okay, um, true. But things like Angular do it differently, by the way. Uh, they don't write on click, they, they add, well, they rewrite ng-click and they actually do this in the background. So um, Angular is quite compatible with CSP. This is version one, this is 2010. This was a research paper and they said, we propose the use to do this. Um, it actually came from, from some thing called content restrictions, which was floating around before. And they actually implemented this in, in the browser. Awesome. People were like, whoa, this is really powerful. This looks very good. 
Of course, um, browser support now, this is level one, is, is uh, across the board, so everybody supports this. And of course, um, people started looking at CSP. This is how it works in, in the academic community. You write a paper, um, people look at this, say like, oh, this is pretty cool, let's take a look, let's try it out. And then they're like, whoa, what? <laughs> and they looked at, um, well, another paper goes into bit, a bit more depth. And they say, they looked at CSP, they tried it out on, on an application, um, on two applications actually, and um, they, they had some conclusions. And they say, first of all, these HTML security policies um, are the way forward. It's, it's very powerful, it's very good, um, so we should definitely invest in that uh, and focus on that. Um, so that's, that's one conclusion. The second conclusion is that um, it's very complex and it harms performance. So essentially it's unusable. Uh, that's what it comes down to. By the way, they tried that out on Bugzilla and, and yeah, you pronounce this hot crap. There's this conference management system called hot crap. I'm, I'm not kidding you. <laughs> and they tried it out on these systems and um, they actually externalized all the files like they should and, and they concluded that it, it's, it's way too slow. Loading external JavaScript files is, is very painful, it's very difficult, writing all of these things, it's, it simply doesn't work. That's, unfortunately, that's the conclusion. So, legacy applications have inline scripts everywhere. What can you do to enable them? You can add unsafe inline. Um, if you look at the term unsafe inline, it's probably not the right way to do it. Um, it's actually true. Um, because essentially what it says is allow inline script blocks. So it wouldn't be able to prevent um, an injected script block from being executed. So this is definitely not the way to go. This, is, this paper actually um, led to CSP level two. And in CSP level two, they looked at the way, how can we re-enable inline scripts? Because a lot of people actually depend on it. They actually want the script to be loaded very fast and start executing very fast. They don't want an extra uh, script load. So how can we re-enable that? Because this is definitely required if you want to make CSP work. And they came up with two things, hashes and nonces, which sounds more complicated than it is. Hashes, you can simply add a hash to your CSP policy. And the hash represents the hash from a script block. So if you want to load an, in, an inline script block, you can calculate the hash yourself. Um, you can put a hash in your CSP policy. Chrome, when it encounters an inline script block or Firefox or whatever, um, they will calculate the hash, check the CSP policy, and if it matches, they execute it. If it doesn't match, they don't execute it. This is what the error you get. By the way, if you get an error, so if you have an inline script block, Chrome gives you the hash, so you don't have to calculate it yourself. You can simply copy paste it from here into your CSP header, and you're done. This is actually very awesome. Um, this means if an attacker injects something, the hash will not be in the CSP policy, and it will be blocked. If you do it as a developer, you can update your policy, and you can allow inline script blocks. Very cool. Bonus feature, if you enable hashes, unsafe inline gets ignored. Why is that important? That's backwards compatibility. So you can deploy a CSP level two policy with hashes, but if you have a browser that doesn't support it, um, it would break because it, it wouldn't want to execute inline script blocks. So you can add unsafe inline for the older browser. It doesn't get protection, but it gets a working application, which is uh, already a win, and a new browser gets this protection from hashes. Very, very, very uh, useful. So in our example here, this would mean that we would add a script SRC, SHA, whatever for this script block. Note that this thing is still disabled. So there's no way to re-enable that. Um, that's essentially bad coding style they never ever want to support. So. If you don't, I'm a little late, you might start noticing. Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> if you convince everybody that it's okay, then yes. Do, do your best. <laughs> Thanks for messing up my recording, by the way. <laughs> Does that just mess up your recording? Yeah, yeah. I, I was on a roll, man. <laughs> that's what I do. I'm sorry to interrupt. Second um, mechanism you can use is a nonce. You add this nonce to your CSP header here, and you add it to your script, uh, script block as well. So you can have a script block, you add a nonce attribute with a value, same value appears here in the header, and that tells the browser that this script block is uh, meant to be there, and it should be executed. That's my pre shared key line thing, then. Sorry? That's a pre shared secret. Then. Um, yes, but it should be fresh for every page, because if you, oh. if you add a static nonce, um, I can go look at your page, see, oh, the nonce is uh, whatever, foobar, uh, inject the block with foobar, and uh, I still own your, uh, your web page. So this thing um, is very useful if you have dynamic, uh, dynamic pages, dynamically generated pages. You can easily generate a fresh nonce, put it in a header, put it in the script tags, and um, you're up and running. 
So that's what it comes down to. By the way, um, nowadays, the, this is also getting uh, enabled for static pages. So there's an Nginx module that is able to, to add nonces to a static page as well. Again, if you use nonces, CSP level two, unsafe in line gets ignored. So this makes this mechanism backwards compatible with older browsers as well. In our application, very straightforward. Um, it would require you to add a nonce here and add it to your header as well. And again, this block is enabled. Note, on, on click handles, uh, don't get enabled. And, and I can tell you this for the future slides uh, or upcoming slides, it's never gonna get enabled again. So if you're do still doing this, CSP is gonna be very painful for you. Um, but you should start working on improving that coding style. <coughs> okay, sounds simple enough, right? Well, if you look at a real life CSP policy, this is what you get. So this is from Dropbox. Um, you see script SRC, they load uh, some scripts, they actually use nonces uh, there. You can have default SRC, which applies to anything else if you don't specify something more specific, and then you have all of these other types of content that are in there. Images, objects, media, fonts, um, whatever. That's, you, and that's sent with every yes. Yes. Font. yes, absolutely. Oh dear. Yes. <laughs> Actually, uh, they, they have a, a very extensive series of blog posts about this. They actually do it quite well. So they, they uh, spend a lot of time and effort in doing this, um, which is uh, quite respectable. They took the time to, to blog about that as well. Um, something you'll also see here is form action. Form action is one of these new CSP features. They start adding stuff. It allows you to uh, prevent form submissions to stuff uh, to places where you don't want it. So you can specify if there's a form submission, um, only send it to these hosts, not, not ever uh, to somewhere else. Why, is, why does this help? This helps if somebody injects HTML instead of script. If somebody injects a fake form and calls it username password, a user may be tempted to fill it out and submit it to um, a strange origin, which is definitely not okay. Browser support is um, quite well, um, i.e. Edge, well, Edge wasn't uh, on board yet, but they're uh, getting there, so they should have CSP level two support very soon. So that's, um, that's CSP level two. Any questions before we move on? Because now it gets really interesting. Yeah. How, how does this influence the use of the base stack? Um, I don't think it's, I don't think it really uh, influences that, uh, it, it's, yeah. Yeah, so CSP would protect against this, that's because um, then the URLs would change for the resources you're trying to load, right? So once the resource, uh, the URLs change, then uh, they're not gonna be whitelisted anymore and uh, you're gonna be protected against that. You can also uh, constrain that, there's, oh, I forgot a, uh, an enter here, so you can constrain the base URI um, to, to specific hosts as well. That's also a new feature in level two. Okay. CSP level two, it's getting a bit more complex. Um, people were actually quite happy with this. You could have inline scripts, you could have the hash system, that's very nice. So people actually invested in CSP. So deployment actually, I have the deployment numbers in a bit, actually went up. So people were like, yeah, CSP is very good. A lot of promotion, things like that. Then Google came out with a paper last summer and they were like, yeah, um, you know CSP? Well, with all due respect, but most policies suck. You can bypass almost every CSP policy out there, which is, um, well, it's, it's kind of bad news, and it's, it was a blow to all of the people that actually spent time and effort in doing that, and um, they actually were able to check these bypasses in an automated way as well. So they could simply scan websites, scan CSP policies, and were like, yeah, that's not gonna work. Um, and the reason, I'm gonna go into details on that. So this is, um, this is where it becomes a, a bit complicated. Um, they found all kinds of bypass attacks for all kinds of reasons. So they built a tool where you can evaluate your CSP policy. So um, this tool, you can enter a website here and it will download the policy itself uh, and check it against these uh, attacks that were discovered by Google. This is the, the security policy, well, the CSP policy from securityheaders.io, um, which is unfortunately not very secure. Uh, <laughs> this is kind of ironic. Um, 
What's the problem? Well, they, Google only checks uh, script SRC, by the way, because that's where the interesting stuff is. The problem here, or the main problem, is they whitelist CDNs. So uh, they whitelist uh, cloudflare.com. Of course, cloudflare.com hosts a lot of crap, um, like Angular, for example. And um, unfortunately, you can use Angular to bypass CSP. So what is this about? The whole paper, there's a paper from that. Um, there's also a presentation from AppSec EU uh, last year. It's very, very interesting, very entertaining. Um, it contains a lot of very useful information on CSP. So I'm, I'm gonna go over four common mistakes or bypasses to show you what this is all about. First of all, a lot of people omit object SRC. To be honest, I did as well before this paper came out because I didn't use objects. Um, I didn't really care about that. So um, it's easy to not specify that. What this means is, um, if you have a flash file um, here, so if you only constrain scripts and not objects, if you, you, somebody can inject a flash file from somewhere, a vulnerable flash file, give it some data, which will eventually lead to cross-site scripting within a flash file. So there's, uh, this, is, this is a real thing, yes, uh, it happens. So people can use that to start executing scripts, and it is allowed by your CSP policy, because object SRC is not constrained, and it can be loaded from somewhere, yes? When you do say object sources and on, what exactly do you buy? Applets I'm and sorry. flash files. And that's it? Yeah. Some, something they discovered in a lot of websites, if you have script SRC self, um, you constrain objects, that's good, script SRC self, but then you have a user upload feature where somebody can upload some JavaScript, then of course uh, you're in trouble again. Somebody can uh, inject something that loads this file, um, that file will be um, included and executed. So that's so a common bypass. JSONP uh, whitelist bypasses. So um, if you have whitelist a host that, uh, that has JSONP endpoints and somebody can control the callback, then they can start um, reflecting uh, any arbitrary script commands through that and start executing it. Twitter CDNs actually have this, um, so that's definitely a problem. And then a whitelist bypass with AngularJS. Um, this is uh, the Cloudflare. Well, the Angular is hosted everywhere. This, uh, for example, on Cloudflare. So if you whitelist Cloudflare, somebody might inject um, a script to load the Angular library if you haven't done that yourself already. And then if he's able to inject something like this, this is not considered script code. This is a diff with an ng click attribute, which doesn't mean very much. But if the user clicks this, this will uh, be evaluated by Angular, which in turn results in script code being executed. Yes? Please stop me if I'm Yeah, it's sure. It's a bigger anti-pattern, is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. If you're, if you're doing that, you're allowing, you're, you're, you have much bigger problems than just a little script execution, I would dare say. That's usually a command injection vector almost always. Uh, I upload a JSP. Yeah, JSP okay, it, 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 depe it depends if the web server is gonna look there for um, executable files. But yeah, yeah, so of course, sure. I'm gonna do JSON P, is that a browser bug at this point? Is this something that, that browsers have tried to shut down? Way. No, because it, a lot of applications depend on it. Mm -hmm. It's a legitimate way of loading data. But I thought JSONP is only going to be a, a, a real problem if you do stuff like uh, allow different certain setters and headers to be overridden so you can get to that JSON. No? Um, no, I, I don't think it's, it's that big of a, well, that difficult to execute but, or exploit. Um, well, the, the main problem you have here is that somebody can call a, a host that's whitelisted in your, in your CSP policy, and the host will return a script file that uh, calls your callback with some JSON data. That's essentially it. Uh, that's, that's what JSONP is about. So you can uh, reflect this on Twitter and say, um, handle, help me, help me, handle Twitter timeline info, whether that's an endpoint, I don't know. That's, let's assume it is and it will call that function in my code with uh, the JSON data that Twitter has provided. So um, that's a way that it was used a lot to bypass cross-origin restrictions before course was there. So it's a way to load data cross-origin, um, but it's, it's a, an, an injection vector by design because you give the server the name of a function and then you hope that, that it doesn't do anything else. Um, 
Yes, but that's, that's what we're talking about here. So CSP is meant as a second line of defense against cross-site scripting. So we are already under the assumption that there is an attack factor, um, but normally CSP would block it off. In this case, CSP would simply allow this to fly through because this matches the CSP policy. That was helpful, thanks. And that's, that's what we're talking about here. So they have uh, a few more of these. Um, essentially what it comes down to, if you look at this table, 95% um, of CSP policies are bypassable. So this means that a lot of effort in security um, just out the window by one Google paper, essentially. <laughs> the reason they, they, they focused on this is they actually tried to deploy CSP level two for their services, but they failed. They said like, with all due respect, but this thing is not usable. This doesn't work for us. Um, and it works, well, what they proposed to fix it, and I'm gonna explain that in a bit more detail because some people have asked me about it. So they, they tried this, it said that doesn't work, and then you have all of these bypasses, so um, let's, let's do it in a different way. Let's use nonces. Get rid of the bypass and use nonces to whitelist script tags, um, which can be either remote or local. And then the second thing is enable strict dynamic. And strict dynamic is a new execution mode where you actually propagate the trust you already have in loaded scripts. So if you load a script from, from a server with uh, strict dynamic, you basically tell the browser, let the script do whatever it wants, I trust it. Uh, and because of that, you actually get a lot of compatibility with, um, with uh, scenarios you have on the web uh, today, which I will show on the next slide. So important note here, strict dynamic only applies to correctly inserted scripts, so you need to have access to the DOM APIs to do that. Um, simply writing a script tag in the, in the body and hoping that the parser will pick it up um, will not work with this. And this also limits, uh, this, this creates a little bit of an attack surface, but it limits it to the DOM API. So you need to check whether um, you have uh, some untrusted inputs being used to inject script tags into the page, and then uh, that's the only thing you need to check to make sure that you're protected. So what is this about? Um, this is about Twitter, for example. If you wanna load Twitter, you configure a Twitter widget on the web page, and you get this snippet of code that you need to include in your uh, web page. Snippet of code is, is an, an href. In case stuff doesn't work, you can go here directly. And the second thing is a piece of script. And this script will replace this with a Twitter timeline. Like you get the, the full widget, and you actually see a Twitter timeline on the web page. If you look at this closely, you see that it's gonna load some additional scripts. So it's building a URL here. Um, it's gonna load something from platform.twitter.com. Um, but that's only the tip of the iceberg. If you load this, Twitter starts pulling in stuff, like Twitter uh, platform.twitter.com, this widgets.js, and then starts loading stuff, boom, boom, boom. It's a lot of uh, content, JavaScript, uh, CSS, um, essentially this is like a snowball uh, going down and it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. If you wanna do this with CSP level two, this is an inline script block, you can add a nonce here, that's not a problem, that works. And then once you do that, you get this uh, list of errors saying that, yeah, I also want this and this and this and this, damn. You have to whitelist this and you have to add it. And essentially what will happen here, if you look at these files, they have fingerprints in there or, or uh, checksums or whatever. Um, and what you see is that um, these will change over time. So every time Twitter pushes out an update, you would have to update your CSP policy if you made it too strict. So people simply will um, define a policy like this. Yeah, whatever, platform.twitter.com and uh, cdn.syndication.twimg.com, whatever, allow it. And that's where this thing kicks in and says like, ooh, but you have JSMP there and essentially you have your bypass. And that's how these things happen. It's, it's a normal reaction, um, but you made your CSP policy too open. So what does strict dynamic do? If you have this, um, essentially what happens here, in, in, in essence, the process is you put code from Twitter here. This is barely readable. Um, this is a small snippet. If it would be even larger, you have no idea what Twitter is doing. And essentially, Implicitly, you already trust what it's doing. You give it access to your context. You run its code in your context. So essentially, what you say here is, um, fine, I wanna load this as well. In, in a traditional CSP policy, you're gonna whitelist this because you want to do the widget. And that's what strict dynamic implicitly allows you to do. So you can say strict dynamic, which tells the browser, this script block is trusted, I have put a nonce here, I trust this code, so just let it do whatever it needs to do. Let it run. Want to load resources? Fine, do it. Um, as long as it uses the correct APIs uh, with node insertion and stuff like that, it's fine, load it. And that's essentially what strict dynamic is all about. Loading scripts dynamically, and this makes it very compatible with existing applications. So this leads to this kind of universal CSP policy, a policy that works for most applications because you can um, essentially get it done with nonces. So 
This is the universal CSP policy. Um, let me walk through because what, this has a lot of fallback mechanisms for older browsers. So let me show you what it means. Um, I'm going to show that in the next slide for a modern browser. It comes down to you trust scripts with the nonce, and then uh, essentially you have strict dynamic to allow dynamic loading, and that's all you need. Um, this is compatibility. I'm going to show you that in the next slide. So that's the policy. If you have a modern browser that supports the strict dynamic feature, you actually um, get this policy instead of this one. So you have the nonces, you have the strict dynamic, um, and it ignores the whitelist here, and it ignores the unsafe inline. That's what it comes down to. Unsafe eval is there. Um, injection through eval is not that big of an issue, um, so they, um, they opted to allow that for compatibility reasons um, as well. This gives you protection against remote injection. So if somebody injects a script uh, that loads from a remote resource, the nonce will not be there and you're protected. Same for an inline script, the nonce will not be present there, so you will be protected against these kind of things, which is good. If you have an older browser, um, you still have CSP level two. Um, essentially what you get is this policy. You have non support that's, that's available, um, but you don't have strict dynamic, which means that you have to fall back to a whitelist. In this case, this is a just allow everything whitelist. Um, this means that you don't get protection against remote injections anymore, but you do get protection against inline script blocks. So um, that's, that's the, the drawback here. You could still define a whitelist. It would be ignored in this policy anyway. So if you have a whitelist from before, you could still allow it uh, or enable it here. It just requires some effort to keep up to date with that and to make sure it keeps working. Then of course, if you have an older browser, um, you fall back to CSP level one, you have unsafe inline and you have a wide open whitelist, so you actually get nothing except for a working application. So the application uh, protects you against this. Yes, shall I stand here? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, the session was kind of boring this morning. CSP. <laughs> Say CSP. CSP. That's going to follow me around for quite some time, I'm afraid. Include my, my website, please. That would be awesome. <laughs> so um, what it comes down to is um, usage statistics. CSP is on the rise. It, it used to be very small in 2015. Now it's about 5%. Um, and it's probably going to pick up with the strict dynamic because compatibility has improved um, quite a lot. So I actually had more content than I anticipated. Um, so let me quickly run to the most the longest conclusion ever, which seems like a very bad idea now at the time, but the problem is I covered a lot of stuff. Uh, I dropped a lot of information on you, but um, it's not yet practical, practical or advice. And I wanted to give you something uh, which you can focus on in 2017. I actually uh, prepared some, some slides about which things are actually important and how much impact they have on your application. I'm gonna run through it very fast. Um, I have some indication for uh, new system and old systems. So this is the new system. Um, the very light and lightweight butterfly is your old system. Uh, this is an old system, sorry, this is a new system. Um, this thing is gonna be very hard to support. Um, this thing, uh, you can take these things into account from the beginning. So um, let, me, let me go through it, it's, I, I'll keep it uh, under five minutes. So HTTPS is a security baseline, no details here. Um, you should be deploying everything over HTTPS, old or new, doesn't matter. And HSTS should definitely be important to work towards. Be careful with preload, like we covered. Um, run it in normal HSTS mode first. Um, you get 99% of the protection in normal HSTS mode. It's just the first request that preload covers, um, which is less of an issue in most applications. HPKP, stay away from that. It's very dangerous unless you're uh, running WikiLeaks, then you might wanna um, think about deploying something like that. Impact, it's actually very low. You should be moving towards it anyway. Importance, very high uh, for both kinds of systems. So that's the main focus. If you wanna do one thing in 2017, it's moving towards HTTPS, um, definitely. Second thing, protect your cookies. That's not something I talked about here. It's something I talked about in the previous talk. So this is kind of a summary for the, all the stuff I talked about um, in the previous days. Um, definitely very important, the basic stuff should be there, but you should also start thinking about cookie prefixes and the same, same site um, directive. So um, even if the, most of your users have a browser that doesn't support these new features, start doing it, uh, make, it make them future-proof. It's a small effort, um, very low impact, and definitely very important in today's uh, web. Browser-based XSS protection, XSS protection, we talked about that. Um, 
two, two options, either turn it off, um, which is only recommended in very specific scenarios, uh, so you should be running it in blocking mode. Uh, that's definitely the safest call. Um, this is not your primary uh, focus. So you should do this if you have covered all of your other XSS attack factors. It's a defense and depth mechanism, not a primary defense, and not something you should be doing if you have other issues that need to be addressed first. Verify what you're letting in. This is essentially sub-resource integrity. Um, many CDNs are compatible, so start using that um, if you want to. If you have missed that, uh, take a look at previous uh, sessions when the recordings are online. It's definitely recommended. Um, very important, if you offer public libraries yourself, if you're making stuff that other people are using, make sure they can actually, uh, well, you actually have the, the right course header so that people can use SRI for that as well. This is, um, well, in my opinion, for uh, existing systems, moderately important um, because it's going to have some impact. So you have to find all the places you load scripts, you have to find these, uh, these checksums and uh, add them there as well. For new systems, this is definitely easy. You should do this from the get-go. Um, many, many build systems for things like Ember or Angular applications allow you to enable that with one line of config, so uh, this is definitely something you should be doing. And then, of course, restrict what you are loading, uh, what, what's loaded. This is a content security policy. I talked about that a lot, so not too much information there. Um, think about nonsense hashes, make this very useful. Strict dynamic, also very, very powerful, um, so definitely do that. If you're an old system, um, this is gonna have a lot of impact. Uh, think about all the on-click stuff that's everywhere. Um, that's, that's gonna be a real pain to do. Um, but if a system is gonna need to be supported in the coming years, start working towards compliance. Start using this or uh, deploy the right coding guidelines to get rid of this code because you will need to support CSP in the future anyway. New features become part of CSP, are added to CSP, so you should definitely work towards supporting CSP. If it's not for the, the coming year, then do it for the future, do it for in two years. Uh, but start working on that because it's not gonna get any better, uh, essentially. New systems make CSP compliance uh, mandatory. This is not difficult if you're building something new, you have all the choices, you can, can choose the right technology, you can choose a framework like Angular, Ember, React, and they are actually very easy to use in combination with CSP. And then finally, design your applications correctly. Uh, think about a front-end application like you do about a back-end application. You need something like an architecture. You need to think about this. Uh, like I said, front-end development is not just some putting some JavaScript together with some HTML. Um, we're way past that. Um, it's still, you can still do it like that, but you can also still hack a server-side system together and hope that it doesn't break. Um, I know some people still do it, but the most important thing here is um, Take this seriously. We covered, during the course, we covered a lot of additional stuff that supports this. Do threat modeling on your front-end applications. Think about that. Don't consider it to be like, yeah, whatever, it's some JavaScript and HTML. No, it has become a real application with real needs and uh, requirements for a real architecture. Again, existing systems, this is gonna be a real pain to do, but new systems, it's gonna have some impact. I'm not gonna lie to you. This is not as easy as simply um, forking something from GitHub and starting adding stuff to it. It requires some conscious effort, but it's gonna be definitely gonna be worth it uh, towards the future. That brings me to the conclusion. You need to put some effort in security. I'm gonna go quickly through this. Um, you have all of these tools available, um, but you need to learn how to handle them correctly. And you're not gonna learn that if you don't start doing that. Uh, that doesn't mean that you should enable this without thinking on the biggest application you have, but it means that you should start if you're not doing anything uh, at all, from these technologies, start with a small team. Start with a couple of people to figure out what, what it, does it mean to build uh, CSP into this new application. Hey, we're building some small tool here. Let's make it compliant with, with uh, these policies. Let's try to isolate certain things in a different context. Let's see what happens. And once you get experience with this, you can actually start building um, more and more secure applications. A final warning. Front-end security is, is very cool, very important. Uh, it's the stuff I do, um, but it's doesn't mean that backend security is not important. If you have command injections, if you have SQL injection, then all of this is, is essentially pointless because people will still go to the server and hack, uh, hack it through there. So um, it's a complementary task, but it's definitely something that is important. So that's my send off here. Um, build secure applications, use the knowledge that, uh, that you've gained during uh, SecUp Dev, and start actually building uh, secure applications for all of us and share your experiences if you do it. Um, Dropbox did it when they deployed CSP. They actually um, shared how they did it. It's very useful. 
Uh, it's a lot of info in there. Um, so follow their lead and share yourself, um, local communities, blog posts, whatever. Uh, everybody has something useful to say on these things. That's it. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm still here for the rest of the day. Um, so enjoy coffee. <laughs>